In case you're wondering, that word right there is pronounced superposition. To superpose two waves means to have them exist in the same place at the same time. And honestly, everything you really need to know about this topic is captured in this gift that you're looking at right now. So take a careful look. And now that you get it, I think we can call it a day. That's a wrap. Thanks for joining us. Okay, fine. I guess we'll go into a little bit more detail. I like this little example that your book brings up. They point out that for something like two baseballs being launched from these, uh, uh, this is a batting cage. I don't know what you call the thing that actually launches the baseballs, but if they're crossed like this, that's not going to work if the balls are fired at the same time because they'll bounce off of each other. You can't have two massive objects occupying the same space at the same time, or at least not two baseballs. But the situation is different when you're talking not about uh, discrete chunks of mass colliding the way we talk about in mechanics, but waves passing through a medium. Remember, a wave uh, is not comprised of the bulk motion of matter. It's really the motion of energy through a medium. And something I've neglected to say up to this point, when we talk about the speed at which a wave travels, we're really talking about the speed at which the energy travels through the medium. You could also say that it's the speed at which information travels. All of the, the waves you're familiar with for sending information, including radio waves, um, sound waves broadcast from a, a public announcement system, PA system, and really even Let's say you're using sign language. That's also an electromagnetic wave because it's light that's carrying the image from the person signing to the person watching the signer. In any case, it is possible for two different waves, two separate signals that were produced at speaker A and speaker B to coexist in the same space at the same time. Those, the waves pass through each other in a sense. And that's one of the topics of this chapter. So there's a distinction between uh, the waves that we're talking about now and more familiar things like baseball colliding. Is that familiar? How often does that happen in real life? That's not supposed, supposed to happen in the, the sport of baseball. <clears throat> well, it's just as easy as you might guess. If you have two separate signals, one's a triangle wave here, and then we've got uh, these two triangles stacked up, and those two signals are traveling in opposite directions, and they're about to collide. They, you know, not collide in the sense of the baseballs, but collide in space and time. If you'd like to know what the net disturbance is, it's the first thing you would guess. You just take the height of each curve at a particular point at a particular time and you add them up. That's what it means to say that the total displacement is the algebraic sum. That, that word algebraic almost isn't even necessary. It's just, it's just the sum. So that's how the author has constructed this plot here. Now, let's see here. What's going on in this third graph? Uh, since this, <coughs> this peak is moving to the right and this peak is moving to the left, at the moment, they both overlap here. This dashed peak describes both of them. They, they coincide. So you would just take the height of the curve like uh, at X equals three meters here, each peak let's say has a height of one, you add the two heights together and you get a total height of two. That's it. Now, a moment later, the left, uh, the peak that was on the left has now moved to uh, X equals four. And this peak right here <coughs> has now moved to X equals two. However, the trailing peak for the signal on the right now is at also at X equals four. It moved from five to four. Am I confusing you? So this, this peak on the top of the x-axis is the one from the original signal coming from the left. And this uh, valley here is from this part of the original signal coming from the right. And since the rule is you just take the algebraic sum, you can see that everywhere in this region between x equals three and x equals five, when you add the y-coordinate of uh, the first disturbance, that's this one, to the y-coordinate of the second disturbance, I'm referring to this one, you get zero. And that's what they call 
destructive interference. If you add the two waves and you get a Y coordinate that's less than uh, one of them, that's typically called destructive interference. Now, after they've finished mingling and they've passed through each other, they just go their separate ways undisturbed. You can see, wait, is that right? Is this last picture consistent with this one? Because, oh yes it is, because this whole thing now has made it over here. See that? All of this is the pulse that was originally over here at t equals zero. And now this one has made it to the other side. You probably didn't need me to say that. You probably understood all of this when I showed you that GIF at the beginning of the presentation, but you made me continue, so here I go. <clears throat> what else can we say about this? Why don't we label these two signals? And I could have used a capital D for displacement, but in previous slideshows, I sometimes used the familiar letter F to talk about these functions. And these are functions of position and time. Uh, you could even call this Y, right? In algebra, we like to use the letter Y for the height of a curve. So the displacement of the string, if you want to think of it that way, depends on where you are on the string and the time. And I'm talking about a particular function, particular signal. That's why I'm labeling it with one. And then I've labeled this pulse or signal with uh, the symbol F2. As they pass through each other, the total displacement, which, because you could just use a single function to describe the displacement of the string at any position at any time. And that that one function that describes everything is simply the sum of the two functions. And you already know how to add functions. Of course, you have to be evaluating these two functions at the same X coordinate, <coughs> excuse me, and the same time coordinate. It wouldn't make sense to evaluate F1 at like X equals two and F2 at X equals eight. What's the point of that? You're always evaluating these functions at the same place and the same time to see how they stack up, so to speak. Well, you've seen this a bunch, of, a bunch of times now, so you're no longer impressed with the wave equation. And if these two pulses that I was just uh, examining exist on a string, a string for which this equation is true, remember we used Newton's second law to analyze a little segment of the string. That's how we wound up with this equation. Well, if those two pulses are pulses that could actually travel on the string, then both of those functions, and I'm going to call them D1 and D2 now, instead of F1 and F2, both of those displacements, which depend on position and time, should obey the wave equation. Because if I go back, uh, it's possible that this pulse could be propagating down the string without this one being present, right? There's no reason they have to both be there. So. D1 of XT, which describes this pulse, it could be, it could exist by itself on the string and so could this one. So each of those signals separately satisfies the one dimensional wave equation. And if that's the case, let's find out whether the sum of the two signals also satisfies the wave equation. Because if the principle of superposition is legitimate, if it actually works for waves on a string, for instance, then the sum of the two functions, which is a third function, that third function should also satisfy the wave equation. If it doesn't, then the physics is telling us it's not possible for that signal to exist. If you actually did send one triangle peak down the, the wave and then you sent this other waveform down from the right, if, if their sum did not satisfy the wave equation, then they would not behave the way uh, these, this series of graphs indicates. Okay, so let's just check that that's the case. Here is their sum. I could have called this just capital D for the total displacement or D3, but I'll just write it as D1 plus D2. This is the algebraic sum of those two signals and you could think of it as its own function. What is the second time derivative of the total displacement? Well, we know that derivatives are linear operators. The derivative of a sum of two functions is just the sum of the derivatives. You know that from first semester calculus. It's, it works just as well for second order derivatives. So I've distributed, so to speak, the second order derivative operator, but what is the second time derivative of D1? Well, since D1 satisfies the wave equation by assumption, 
then the second time derivative should be equal to speed squared times the second space derivative. So this quantity right here should be numerically equal to this quantity. And the same goes true for the second time derivative of D2. That quantity should be the same as the right hand side over here. So let me make those substitutions and I get this. So the second time derivative of the sum of the displacements is this junk, which I won't attempt to put into words. Too many syllables. But do you notice that we can factor out the square of the speed? So let me do that. And I get this. And I'm going to leave it at that. What I've done is I've, yeah, let's do this. Since I haven't included a subscript up here, let's think of capital D as representing the sum of those two separate signals. So what I've really done here is take the second derivative with respect to time of capital D. I've evaluated the left-hand side of the equation. Now let's evaluate the right-hand side and see if they match. If they do match, it means that the algebraic sum of those two signals is another signal that can exist on the wave. So what is V squared times the second derivative with respect to position of the total displacement? Again, this operator, the second derivative with respect to X is a linear operator. That means you can distribute it and just write it like this. So I've distributed the derivative operator to both terms and I'm done, right? Because as I've highlighted in blue, these are the same. That indicates that this quantity here is the same as this quantity here. In other words, we've shown that the sum of the two signals, D1 plus D2, satisfies this equation. Okay, to summarize, if D1 of X comma T is a solution of the wave equation and D2 is a solution of the same equation, then the sum of the two signals or functions is also a solution of the wave equation. So it is a possible uh, motion of the string in time. And that should make the, princ the principle of superposition plausible. Now, this is not something I've really studied myself, but the fact that the, the medium, in this case, the string I've been using, satisfies this equation, that came out of using Newton's dynamics to look at that little piece of mass on the string. It's conceivable that there would be different types of mediums or media for which you could not produce a wave equation. If whatever the medium is, if you're applying the relevant physics to that medium and you're not able to produce this equation exactly, or you get some other related equation that's not exactly the same, then you can't necessarily conclude that superposition is possible. Maybe it is, maybe that other equation uh, also satisfies this condition of superposition. It, it just depends on how the, the operators all work out. But I'm just pointing out that you don't want to assume that you can use superposition in all instances. Now, in this class, yes, the, the waves that we're going to look at, definitely. Uh, electromagnetic waves can be superposed in vacuum. Sound waves can be superposed. You already kind of know that, right? If you're sitting in a restaurant, if you really want to, you can eavesdrop on the people sitting at any number of tables near you. And that means all those different sound waves are existing in the same medium. They're all entering your ear at the same time. And magically your, your brain's able to uh, dissociate them. So you're already familiar with this principle. There's some real gems out there on the web as far as simulations go, if you look, is this not the most inspired domain name ever? I want to study.org. What do we have going on here? It looks like two sinusoidal waves. Let me hit the play button. Aha, two separate signals. You could call the blue one D1 if you'd like and the green one D2. And they're passing through each other. So they're going in opposite directions. So now we're looking at a very specific case of two signals uh, passing through the same medium. They are both sinusoids. They have the same amplitude. You can see they have the same wavelength and evidently the same frequency as well. How do I know that they have the same frequency? Well, I can tell they're moving at the same speed and they definitely have the same wavelength. And if, if you know two out of three are the same, the third one's gotta be the same frequency, wavelength and speed. Okay, not only that, they have the same amplitude. 
Did I say that already? So what should be this, the algebraic sum of these two functions? Can you guess? Maybe you've already read it in your book. I hope you have. But what does it look like when you add two sinusoids of equal amplitude, frequency, wavelength, et cetera, passing through each other in opposite directions? Well, this website will do that for us. Let me check the, uh, the box here. Look, they even have this, um, this mysterious question mark full of suspense. Whoa. Okay, so the red, the red function, which clearly depends on where you are on the x-axis and it depends on the time because you can park yourself at any particular place on the x-axis and you see the displacements changing with time. Obviously, if you freeze time like this, the height of the red curve also depends on position. So it's definitely a displacement capital D that depends on x and time. And what's surprising is it's not traveling left and it's not traveling right. It's not a progressive wave. So the result here is something not obvious at all. There's no reason why you would know it if you had not studied physics or some math, but a standing, this is called a standing wave because if you look at the peaks or the valleys, they stand in place instead of traveling or progressing right or left. Who knew who, or who would have guessed without this analysis that a standing wave can be thought of as two progressive waves passing through each other. Of course, there's that caveat where they have to have the same frequency, wavelength, and speed. <clears throat> and these, uh, oops, I hit pause on the simulation. I thought I hit pause on the recording. Uh, what's so important about these standing waves? Well, your chapter has quite a bit to say about them but they're everywhere. Standing waves are everywhere. Uh, standing sound waves are what produce tones for musical instruments. Uh, when you speak, there are standing waves within your vocal cords, the air column. I don't know the details. You get a trachea and a larynx and all this gross stuff. Uh, when you sing in the shower, same thing, standing waves. Lasers are standing electromagnetic waves. And believe it or not, you could even say that the electrons orbiting hydrogen atoms or any atom for that matter are standing waves. Whoa, I just took that way out of uh, context there. Electrons, standing waves, yes. In fact, the more I learn about physics, the more I realize that uh, one of the biggest reasons for studying all this introductory stuff is to relate it. So you have pictures in your mind to understand more abstract and frankly, more interesting things like how atoms work. So any of you who are gonna go into chemistry or physics or this stuff will, will pay off later. A lot more applications of standing waves than just the fields of chemistry and physics. I'm sure there are many I'm completely unaware of, but I also know that uh, in electrical engineering, those of you who may study waveguides, transmission lines, when you send, when you broadcast a radio signal, you have to have what's called an oscillator. You need a, a carrier frequency. And very often that, that comes from standing electromagnetic waves in, inside these rectangular metal wave guides. So you see it all over the place in applied math and engineering. Okay, let's see if we can show mathematically why you get that standing wave pattern when you have two progressive waves passing through each other. And this shouldn't be difficult, just a little bit of trigonometry. Well, we've already looked in depth at these uh, sin sinusoids, which depend on position and time. Notice this one's got a minus sign. So we know that D1, the signal D1 is traveling to the right and the signal D2 is traveling to the left. And the total displacement or disturbance, because I say uh, disturbance because it may not be an actual physical displacement. If you're talking about in an electromagnetic wave, nothing's being displaced. It's the change in the electric field that you're talking about. We just add them up. Can we factor out that A? Whoa, what happened there? What's going on? Aha, we are going to need a trig identity. And this one is probably one that you don't have memorized unless memorizing trig identities is something that you just have a fetish for. So down here, it's one of the, uh, the sum, the so-called sum identities, the sign of the sum of two angles can be written this way. 
So if you want to memorize that, I've seen this so many times I do have it memorized. It, you just have an alpha beta in there, another alpha beta. You start with sine cos and then you flip the order of sine and cos, that's it. And this is the one we're going to use right now. We're not going to use the cosine version. And check that out, there's a graphical proof, which I won't spend time going through, but I did stare at that for a while and convince myself that it works. However, a lot of these derivations, you keep in mind, uh, aren't, aren't maybe as general as you'd like because here both of the angles are less than 90, for instance. What if they were greater than 90? Does the formula not work? If, if you're using this picture to prove your results, then it's not totally convincing that the formula is true for any value of alpha or beta. So maybe a better way to do it would be with the power series or uh, it turns out you can write you can write trig functions in terms of the exponential function. That's a story for a different day. Okay, so let's use that identity, which I've reproduced down here. In this function, our quote alpha is kx and the quantity negative omega t plays the role of beta, right? Alpha plus beta, what we're really adding here is plus, excuse me, we're adding negative omega t. Over here, alpha would be kx, beta would be omega t, you get the idea. So these first two terms are what I get when I apply this trig identity, trigonometric trigonom identity to this function, and if I apply the same, if I apply the same identity to the second signal, I get this stuff down here. Now, what can we do with the negative omega t? Uh, ugh, negative omega t. And I realize I forgot to put the minus sign here, but that's of no consequence because you remember the cosine function is an even function, right? Cosine of z is the same as the cosine of negative c, z. You can put a minus sign here. It doesn't make a difference. However, for the sine function, which is odd, we do have to worry about the minus sign. So what we can do is put that minus sign up front like this. And now you see that these two terms sum to zero. That's great when you get some cancellation. Bye, Felicia. And then all we have to do is add these two up. And that's it. So let's take some time to look at this function and we'll see that it really does describe a standing wave. It's not so hard to understand. So there's two components here. Your book likes to call this the amplitude function because it turns out that each, each little particle on the string is oscillating up and down, up and down in time with its own amplitude. And that amplitude depends on where you are on the string. So at different locations on the string, that piece of the string is going up and down with different amplitudes. The amplitude depends on the position. And this is how it depends on position. Notice in this bracketed part, there's no T, just an X. Now, once you've um, evaluated the amplitude function at a particular place on the X axis, then you can see that the cosine function is making that particle jiggle up and down in time. And because it's a sinusoid, again, cosine, sine, same thing, they're just displaced. That one particle is executing simple harmonic motion. So it's like every particle on the string in this standing wave is in simple harmonic motion. And that's actually true for progressive waves as well. I don't know if I made that point clear enough in previous presentations, but as that traveling wave passes through the string, you can pick any point on the string and you'll find that it's going up and down sinusoidally in time. The difference here is that all the particles are going up and down together, or you could say in phase. And you already saw that in the simulation. Okay, so that is the function describing a standing wave. Get used to it, you'll see that uh, repeatedly. Let's go back to that simulation. Okay, here we are again. Let's show the sum of the two displacements. And since we've already established the fact that this is what results from two progressive waves passing through each other. Let's hide both of the original signals and just focus on the standing wave. So before I hit play, here is the so-called amplitude function. I don't have it up on the screen, but remember it was two times A, where A was the amplitude of each individual wave, two A sine of KX. And there it is. If you freeze time, the profile of the string is a sine wave. So 
uh, since I've, well, let me hit play here. You'll, you'll notice that I've actually paused it when, oops, I missed it by just a bit. Good enough. I've paused it when each particle has its maximum displacement from equilibrium. And that means that this particle right here that I'm pointing at, I hope you can see my mouse pointer, that's as high as it's going to get. That's as far as it's going to get from equilibrium. It will never be as high as this one is. So the amplitude of this particle's oscillation up and down is less than the amplitude of this particle's oscillation. The amplitude depends on position. That's why we have that amplitude function. Now, once I set this thing into motion again, pick any particular particle and you'll, you'll see that it's oscillating up and down in simple harmonic motion. And that's what the cosine of omega t part does. In the math function that we just looked at describing a standing wave, the second factor stuck on the right was cosine of omega t. And you can see each particle is oscillating up and down sinusoidally in time. That's what the cosine function does. So it's really easy to separate the action of those two parts of the function in your mind. One tells you how the amplitude depends on time, excuse me, how the amplitude depends on position. And then the second part, the cosine function, just tells you that each one is going up and down sinusoidally, simple harmonic motion. Just a little bit of vocabulary here. As you were watching the standing waves, you probably noticed that there are points along the string that never move. They don't jiggle up and down. That's because their amplitude is zero. So this particle is just going to stay put. That's different from a, a progressive wave. As a progressive wave travels along, every particle at some point is displaced away from equilibrium. Not so with the standing wave. So the parts that never move are called nodes. And the parts that move the most are the anti-nodes. Most of the particles are somewhere in between. But you do want to memorize that an anti-node is uh, a position along the wave, the standing wave, that has the maximum amplitude. So if you were a little ant hanging out on this string, if you didn't want to be disturbed, you would chill right here because the wave's not going to bother you. If you want to go on a thrill ride, head over to the anti-node. And we're not going to do this, but what's really cool is that you can, you can use Newton's second law to develop an expression for the power flowing down, uh, flowing down the string and you find that at all times, energy is being shuttled back and forth between the anti-nodes and the nodes. Now, it's easy to see why the anti-node would be gaining energy because the particles in the anti-node are moving very quickly as they pass through equilibrium. So they have lots of kinetic energy and then they slow down and stop at the top. So they're gaining kinetic energy, losing kinetic energy, gaining, et cetera. So that means there has to be energy flowing into the antinode and then out of the antinode every period. Now, why would energy be flowing in and out of the nodes? Well, the nodes don't move up and down, so they're not gaining or losing kinetic energy. But if you think about uh, the string and how it's kind of like a spring and how it takes work to stretch a string, right now, this string has its maximum stretch right there because the, uh, the slope is greatest in magnitude. So it's got the most potential energy. A moment later, in fact, uh, a quarter period later, this string will be flat as this hump is passing through equilibrium. And that's when the node has its least potential energy. So again, it's possible to do a detailed analysis and you find that the, that the energy is being shuttled back and forth between the nodes and the anti-nodes. But I think that qualitative description will suffice for us. You may be wondering, how do you actually produce a standing wave in real life? How can you get two traveling waves with just the right amplitude passing through each other? And this simulation can help you understand that. So right now I'm going with the fixed end boundary condition and let's just do one pulse. Oops, got to get rid of the damping there. So the fixed end boundary condition forces that pulse to reflect. It's also inverted when it reflects. And if instead of a single pulse, we uh, force it into oscillation, can I slow down this simulation here? Mm, no, unfortunately. Oh, slow motion. 
watch what happens when the initial sinusoidal pul pulses reach the opposite end. So right now there's only a wave traveling to the right. Aha, but then those pulses are forced to reflect and it's not obvious, but what you're looking at now is waves passing through each other. You've got disturbances traveling right, disturbances traveling left. Now this is not a sign, this is not a perfect standing wave. And it turns out it's because the boundary con conditions are not quite right. This driver here is not in the right position. And we'll talk about, about that more in just a moment. But hopefully you can see here, once the reflection happens and you've got a wave going back the other direction, they tend to interfere or superpose in such a way that it looks more like a standing wave. Actually, it's going back and forth, isn't it? What's it doing now? This is weird. But I can tell you this, if, if we change the frequency and found the sweet spot, we could actually set up a real standing wave, but it takes a while to do that. So I'm not going to mess with that. If you'd like to see the same behavior, but with a real string, here it is. I'm sorry about this guy's shirt. That's probably giving you a, a migraine. Good morning. Before we can learn about standing wave patterns, we first need to understand what happens when a wave encounters an end. Flippin physics. In this example, the wave pulse is encountering a fixed end, an end which is fixed in place and will not move. You can see the wave pulse is reflected and inverted. Reflected means it changes directions and comes back the other way. Inverted means the wave pulse is flipped upside down. The other option is called a free end. A free end is free to move up and down as you can see in the video. When a wave pulse encounters a free end, the wave pulse is still reflected. However, it is not inverted. I had some nice boring in his home. So keep that picture in your mind because later in the chapter when we look at thin film optical coatings and interference of light waves, that's going to help you understand that how those thin film coatings work. Okay, well, you could produce standing waves on an interminably long string, but almost every time we're looking at standing waves, we're actually talking about a string with boundary conditions, or we're talking about the vibration of a column of air that has similar boundary conditions. So let's look at a string now that's fixed at both ends, much like a guitar string is fixed at the, what is it, the bridge and the neck? And it does help to recognize quickly what a full wavelength, wavelength is. That's this. It's got a down hump and an up hump. What a half wavelength is. The one hump is a half wavelength. Actually, they're calling it L over 2, but that's specific to this picture. Now I'll let this guy take over and demonstrate some actual standing waves on a string in a physics lab. But if I set it here, for example, I have what's called a standing wave. That is the wave that's, that's sent down and reflects constructively interferes with the next wave that comes down right at this point. Now the waves that reflect, that come down and reflect destructively interfere with the incoming waves right here. And that's called a node. I can touch it and it still is working. Let's bring in some nomenclature from your book. The antinodes, which you just drew your attention to, uh, that is where your book would say maximum constructive uh, interference happens. Interference, again, is, is really just synonymous with um, superposition. They, they mean the same thing. But in the case where the, the waves add and produce the largest amplitude possible, that's called in your book, maximum constructive interference. And then the node, theoretically, the node doesn't move at all. That would be called perfect destructive interference. So the node is not moving. Here it's moving up and down, and here it's moving up and down. And we'll see that in a second with the high-speed camera. the second harmonic. It's the second possibility for a standing wave for a string that's held at both ends. Because notice, this is a node, 
This is a node, and the middle's a node. So we have three nodes for this wave. Now, like I said, second harmonic, well, what's the first one? The first one will be half this number, so 8.5. Here's an important observation. He called this the first mode or the first harmonic. Notice that the first harmonic has only one anti-node. And just a moment ago, he was showing the second harmonic. It had two anti-nodes. So that's true in general. In order to identify the integer that we use uh, to name the mode, you just have to count the number of anti-nodes. If there are six anti-nodes, you're talking about the sixth harmonic. And there we go. Now, I can find any of the other, harm all of the other harmonics are multiples of this number. So we just saw that two times this number was the second harmonic, or the second possibility. Well, if I go three times this number, I should get the third harmonic. Well, three times 8.5, I guess that was that around. 25.5 and there that's another important observation is not only do you see more anti nodes at higher values of n in other words higher harmonics you also see the string oscillating more quickly so the frequency depends on the mode that you're talking about and the relationship between the frequencies is very simple all of the higher harmonic frequencies are multiples of the fundamental frequency. There we go. So that's the third harmonic. How many wavelengths is this? Well, it's one and a half. One and one half wavelengths. And it's easier to see in high speed. So check out this shot with the high speed camera and uh, verify for yourself that it is one and one half wavelengths. Half wavelengths. Well, let's go to the sixth harmonic. The sixth harmonic will just be double this frequency. So we go up to 50. And there we go. That's the sixth harmonic. Beautiful. Something else that's probably worth pointing out right now, and your book talks about this, if you think of this length of string as being analogous to the column of air that fits inside your ear canal, I think your ear canal is just a couple centimeters long, only certain frequencies can set up standing waves within your ear canal. So if you're standing outside and there's something like a vehicle producing noise, which is a really broad spectrum of frequencies, only uh, a discrete set of those frequencies are capable of setting up standing waves in your ear canal. And as a result, your ear is perhaps more sensitive to those frequencies and frequ frequencies near them. And it's probably no coincidence that the human voice contains a number of those frequencies. Let's now confirm his observations mathematically. We know that this is the function which describes a standing wave and x can be any position between the two uh, fixed ends. Right here, I've indicated if we're looking at this position, if this is our value of x, this arrow shows you the height of the string. That would be the value of d. That's the value of the function at this position x at this particular time when the picture was taken. And focus your attention on the right end now. This has the particular x coordinate l. So if we wanted to evaluate the displacement at any time right here, we would plug in the value L for X. However, we can see that because that end is fixed, the displacement has to be zero at all times. So how can we make this function always take on the value zero? One way would be to set A equal to zero, but then you're talking about a wave with zero amplitude, and that means that the whole string would be flat all the time. That's not an interesting case, so we'll have to try some other possibility. Let's not go with A equals zero. Now, cosine of omega t, as t advances, this function oscillates between one and negative one. So that's not going to make it zero. 
the only way for this to be zero at the, uh, the fixed end on the right is if the sine function is equal to zero. So how do we make the sine function equal to zero if the input, also known as the argument or even the angle, or you could also call it the phase, I, I hear all those names, argument, phase, angle, whatever. Well, we know that the sine function has zeros at any integer multiple of pi. Zero times pi produces a zero of the sine function. Sine goes to zero again at pi, two pi. You know all this stuff, right? So that means that the, the uh, quantity in parentheses would have to be an integral multiple of pi. Now, since k is a positive number and l, the length of the string is also a positive number, let's just go with pi, two pi, et cetera. So there it is. KL must equal an integer multiple of pi. And I left off the part where n starts with one, n can be one, two, three, et cetera. So this, this equation, this formula results from the boundary conditions. It's not true in general. If you had an infinitely long string with no fixed n, you could shake that string at any frequency you want and produce any wavelength you want and hence any value of the wave number that you'd like. This condition pops up when you impose boundary conditions. And one reason I'm emphasizing that is because you see the same thing when you look at uh, the behavior of an electron in a tiny little box. Even when you look at the electron orbiting the hydrogen nucleus, which is a proton. Uh, so the more familiar you, you get with these conditions now with simple things like waves on strings, the more digestible it will be when you think about something more abstract. If you solve for K, you get this. And at this point we can add a little subscript to K because we're emphasizing that the, the wave number, the, uh, the set of allowable wave numbers, which wave, wave number you're talking about depends on which integer you've chosen. So it's a, a discrete set of allowable, allowable wave numbers. You can't have any old wavelength on this string with these boundary conditions. Again, I've said this a number of times, but they like that word uh, discrete. It's a discrete set of wave numbers. What else do we know? The wave number is the reciprocal of the wavelength with that factor of two pi thrown in. So if we put these together, we find that n pi over L should be the same as two pi over the wavelength. And I've also added a subscript to the wavelength. There's a discrete set of allowable wavelengths and you can label each of those wave, wavelengths with this index n. And of course that n corresponds to this n. If you move some stuff around, you find this. And this one I think is worth memorizing because you'll use it so often. It's presented in your book. Most of these books on this topic, that's probably what you'll find. So 2L, that's twice the length of the string that's been fixed at both ends. And you can see that as the, the value of N goes up, as it takes on greater integer values, the wavelength goes down. But it's important to remember that N is not a continuous variable. It's not like, uh, position on the x-axis where you could pick any possible number you can think of. N does not take on all real values. It only takes on positive integer values, or you could say the natural numbers. So higher values of N correspond to shorter wavelengths. I would try to memorize this one. That's why I put a blue box around it. Okay, well, if you solve this for L instead of lambda, you get this, and I actually prefer this despite the fact that this is how it's usually uh, presented, I like to think about it in these terms because this formula says something that you can immediately recognize visually. It says that for a standing wave, transverse wave on a string fixed at both ends, the length of the string must be an integer multiple of half wavelengths. You have to be able to fit an integer number of half wavelengths into L, that's it. So how many, <laughs> how many half wavelengths? do we have right here? It looks like just one. If you're confused about why there's a double line, remember the, the faint, fainter line here is showing you where the string will be half a period later. The string is oscillating up and down, up and down. So currently it's, you know, we've frozen time and the string is here. Half a period later, it'll be down here before it returns to the top. So there is one 
half wavelength fitting into the length of the string here. That's the first harmonic, n equals one. And your book, I'll point this out now, your book I think likes to use the letter M as in Mary instead of M. Same thing. Now, why do they avoid the letter N? They must be using N for something else. Okay, here we have a full wavelength fitting into the length of the string. That's two half wavelengths. So not a coincidence there. N equals two, the second harmonic. Notice it's got one, two antinodes. It's got two antinodes and you can fit two half wavelengths into the string. Here you've got three, count them, three half wavelengths. That corresponds to three antinodes. We call that the third harmonic. So the wavelengths are getting shorter as the value of N goes up. So I would memorize one of these. Obviously, if you know one, you can get the other. And here I've gotten rid of the subscript N. It looks like this graphic that I pulled from the web, they're also going with the subscript. They're labeling lambda one is the wavelength that, that you get when you let this integer take on the value one. Lambda three is the wavelength you get when you plug in N equals three. But if you'd like to just write it without the subscript, there it is. Just remember that the, the wavelength here depends on N. It's not like there's only one wavelength you can have. It depends on which, uh, which mode you're talking about. So have I introduced that word yet? We're, we're calling these harmonics. This is the first harmonic, second harmonic, et cetera. You can also call these the normal modes of oscillation. This is the first mode, second mode. This is confusing, right? We've got, we've got N's and M's running around. This, this really uh, tripped me up when I first started studying this. Like, is it a node or is it a mode? There are two different things. The node is the, the point on the string that doesn't move. The mode just tells you which of these motions the string is executing. And then they're using a letter N. Your book uses a letter M, but uh, for the same purpose. Aha, so let's, let's use Python now to plot some of these modes, normal modes of oscillation. For those of you who know more about programming than me, please forgive my lack of vocabulary here, but I think spider is the environment I'm using. This is part of the Anaconda distribution, Python distribution that I recommended downloading. And in order to do what I'd like to do within this little script here, I have to import some libraries. I think they're called libraries, NumPy or NumPy, that's numerical Python and then some graphing or plotting libraries. So what I've done is just picked an arbitrary length for the string. I went with the number 10. And here I can choose which mode I'd like to plot. Your book may have used the letter M. And then I'm calculating the wave number in terms of the, the wavelength. No, not the wavelength, excuse me, the length of the string. Remember that boundary condition that we just looked at. By fixing the ends, we find that only certain wavelengths can exist. And the wave number K must be an integer multiple of pi over L. So what have I written here? This is the integer N and then NP dot pi, that's short for numpy dot the letter pi. Unfortunately, that's the way, that's the only way to call up the number pi in this script. I know there are other Python, uh, uh, I'm not even sure what the word is, like add-ons that you can use where the syntax is a little different, but I'm gonna go with this one for now. And then I've calculated the wavelength lambda in terms of K. Okay, down here, if I wanna make a plot, I have to create uh, an array of X values, basically create an X axis and then calculate the height of the standing wave at each value along, those, uh, along that X axis. So, I won't dwell on the details here. Some of you might be able to figure out what's going on just by looking at the syntax. And then <laughs> all this stuff down here is just boilerplate syntax to add some features to the plot. But let's see what happens. Let's start with the n equals one mode, also known as the fundamental mode or the first harmonic. I'll hit the run button. Yay! So there it is. Uh, the length of the string spans the plot, and you can see that one half wavelength, excuse me, one half wavelength fits into the string. And not coincidentally, there's one antinode. So we call that the first mode or the first 
harmonic. Let's try the second one. We should see two antinodes and two half wavelengths fitting into the length of the string. Remember, the dashed line just shows you where the string will be one half period later. So right now, the, the bold curve shows where the string is. A quarter period from now, the string will be flat as the two humps are passing through equilibrium, or I could say as the antinodes are passing through equilibrium. A quarter period after that, the string will be down here. So the antinodes will be in the opposite positions. I think you get the idea. Let's try the fifth mode. Should I keep going here? And look, I'm so sophisticated. I even put some tick marks or uh, some axis labels down here to show you where the quarter wavelength is and where the half wavelength is. And you can check. Since this is a half wavelength, there are one, two, three, four, five half wavelengths that fit into the length of the string for mode five. Now I'm tempted to put a ridiculously large number in here just to see what happens, but I'm afraid my computer will freeze and then this recording will be foiled. So I'll be conservative and go with a hundred. Let's see what happens. Woohoo! That's not very illuminating. I'll try something a little less ridiculous, like 20. How about 15? Okay, and I'm just gonna throw this out there right now. When it comes to particles, because we're going to see that uh, particles that are the size of atoms or less, really even larger than that, they behave a lot like waves in a lot of circumstances. And the shorter the wavelength, the more energetic. When you see short wavelength, you should, you should think high energy, lots of momentum. Long wavelengths would correspond to less energy and less momentum. The medium of the standing wave does not have to be a piece of string. I've already mentioned that it can be the air inside a musical instrument, but here's a guy making some standing waves with a slinky. The um, lowest frequency standing wave pattern is this one. It's called mode, M-O-D-E, one, or the first harmonic, or in other words, also called the fundamental mode. It's the lowest frequency mode that you can get in a transverse standing wave. If I double the frequency of that mode, I get the second harmonic or second mode and sometimes called the first overtone. And this one, if you'll notice, is going twice as fast as the fundamental mode. It has a note is it just me or does this guy on the right look incredibly bored or worse? It looks just really bummed out. It's bumming me out. Mode, it's exactly halfway between Parker and me. And that's a node where, where there's approximately no motion going on. Two, one, two. So now I'm gonna try and triple the frequency and get a standing wave pattern that coincides with the third harmonic or second overtone um, okay, what he's saying, second overtone, that's some language from music. I would just dump that out of your memory unless you're already familiar with it because that might confuse you. Yes, the second harmonic is called the first overtone. Just like I said, forget about it. Let's just go with, uh, uh, we name the modes with the same uh, integer that we use for the, for the number of anti-nodes. So first harmonic has one anti-node, second harmonic, has two, et cetera. It, it is worth memorizing that the first harmonic is often called the fundamental mode or the fun, it has the fundamental frequency because all the other frequencies are multiples of that fundamental frequency. But don't worry about overtones. Let me try again. Okay, I think I've got it approximately now. I think I had it for a little while there. That's the third mode where the, where the string vibrates in three separate segments. 
there's actually an infinite number of these modes that you can get. Okay, that's enough. Parker, I hope you get some excitement in your life or recover from that hangover. Now, just now, the guy on the left, the instructor here, said that there's, an, theoretically, there's an infinite number of possible normal modes. Now, in reality, you can't really make waves on this slinky that are, what, a micrometer in length? Because that's, it just sounds ridiculous, right? And at some point, you get to a wavelength that's shorter even than an atom. So, of course, you can't make uh, a truly infinite number of modes because the higher you go, the shorter the wavelength is. At some point, your wavelength is less than the diameter of an atom. That makes no sense. However, how many particles, if this really were just a string, a linear chain of atoms, how many atoms will we be talking, would we be talking about? How many atoms can you stack up over the length of this slinky? It's an enormous number, right? At least 10 to the 23rd or thereabouts. I'd have, to think, I'd have to think about that. So that may not be infinity, but it's a really big number. Let's revisit now a, a video that we've already looked at about coupled oscillators. One of the cool videos we looked at from Dr. Dan Russell was this one about the coupled oscillators. Here we've got three coupled oscillators. The oscillators are these styrofoam balls and they're coupled by the, the strings or whatever between them. And you may recall that three coupled oscillators have a total of three normal modes of oscillation. And I think he demonstrated all of them here. That's one of the modes. Notice they're all jiggling at the same frequency. In the, the third mode. Natural mode shape for the three degree freedom system. I, I mentioned that term eigenfrequency. Each mode has its own frequency at which they all oscillate together. So it's not a coincidence. Three oscillators, three normal modes. That's three different frequencies at which they can oscillate in a different pattern. And then I'll skip ahead. These four oscillators have four different eigenfrequencies. You can find four modes of oscillation. They all look different, but in those modes, in those so-called normal modes, all of the oscillators are jiggling together in phase with a, a different frequency than the other normal modes of oscillation. I'm pointing this out because if four coupled oscillators have four norm, normal modes of oscillation and 10 coupled oscillators have 20 normal modes of oscillation, then go back to, imagine that this was a linear chain of 10 to the 23rd atoms, like all the atoms practically in that slinky. How many, uh, how many normal modes of oscillation would exist for 10 to the 23rd particles? Well, theoretically, it would be 10 to the 23rd if you continue this pattern. And those normal modes of oscillations are none other than the standing waves. That's a really cool connection, right? The standing waves, it's really the same phenomenon. Those are uh, all those different modes. And now you see why we're using the word mode because it's the same as this situation. Those standing waves are equivalent to these normal modes of oscillation. But instead of having four or five, you've got uh, you know, a bajillion inside that slinky. So we've determined the possible wavelengths of the standing modes that can exist on a string fixed at both ends. Let's turn that now into an expression for the allowable frequencies. So you can't shake or you can't set up standing waves on a string fixed at both ends with just any old frequency. It has to be a frequency that belongs to a particular set as we'll see right now. So we've got this relation for the allowable wavelengths. We also know the fundamental relation between frequency, speed, and wavelength on a string. If we combine these, notice that uh, lambda is in the denominator, so we'll just take the reciprocal of this expression and stick a velocity in front. And I guess before I do that, I'd like to label the frequencies also with an index n. So the nth frequency is labeled f sub n, and we get this. All I've done is reciprocate this and stick the speed next to it. And if we evaluate this formula at n equals one, the numerator here just becomes the number one. And so this whole expression with a, a one in the numerator is the frequency of the uh, first harmonic, the so-called fundamental mode. And that means we can write the frequency of the nth mode as the integer n times the fundamental mode. Do you see that? If you evaluate this at n equals one, 
uh, you just get this right here. So that's a really simple expression. I, I don't think that's obvious at the outset, but the allowable frequencies are all multiples of that fundamental frequency. And there's a very simple way of calculating the fundamental frequency. The longer the string, the lower the fundamental frequency. The, uh, the higher the speed, the wave speed, the higher the fundamental frequency. You will also recall that for transverse waves on a string, the speed of the waves is determined by the tension and the linear mass density, according to this formula. So now it's everything's in one place. If we know the mass density of the string and the tension and the length of the string, we can very simply calculate the lowest tone that that vibrating string could produce. If we're talking about a guitar string that's, that's in turn producing sound waves. Uh, if, a guitar string, if a guitar string is vibrating, those are transverse waves, but the vibration of the string sets up oscillations of the surrounding air and those subsequent vibrations are longitudinal. Those of you who play a musical instrument or are passingly familiar with an instrument like the guitar, you kind of already know all these things. When you're tuning a guitar, uh, really the only way you do it is by tightening or loosening the screws here, which just changes the tension. If you increase the tension, the frequency of that fundamental mode goes up. And if you, uh, if you loosen the tension, the, the frequency of the fundamental mode goes down. Now I should point out that when you pluck a guitar string, that string is actually vibrating simultaneously in several standing waves or normal modes. Two, two different ways of saying the same thing. Now your ear tends to perceive a dominant pitch or frequency, and this is the dominant pitch that you perceive. So for somebody with perfect pitch or just really good pitch who thinks they're hearing an A on the piano, really they're hearing the frequency 440, but also the frequency 880 and even some higher frequencies. But one of those pitches tends to dominate. So the, the timbre of a musical instrument is more complicated than just a pure tone or pure frequency. According to this formula though, there are two other ways of changing the fundamental frequency of a guitar string. You could also make the string shorter or longer. Shortening the string would make the denominator smaller. That would make the fundamental uh, frequency go up. And that's exactly what's happening when you press on the frets. Yes, the, uh, the total length of the string extends from, I guess you'd call that the bridge all the way up to the nuts at the end of the, or the, uh, the screws at the end of the neck. But when you, when you press your fingers down on the fret, only the section of string between the bridge and your fingers is actually free to oscillate. So you've just shortened the effective length of the string and that means that the frequency goes up. Lastly, of course, if you look at the, the various strings on, on a guitar, and this is true also for a violin and a piano, the heavier strings, which have a greater mass density, they produce the lower tones. So not only does this formula qualitatively confirm what many of you already know about musical instruments, but it, it allows you to actually calculate these things. Your book has a nice discussion about um, tuning a piano, which is a little different from, or not so much tuning a piano, but how the combination of different weights of strings and different lengths of strings can be used to accomplish the, the wide range of frequencies that you find on a piano, because that it is broader than the range of frequencies that can be produced by a guitar. Here's some more close up footage of guitar strings vibrating. Now, part of what you're going to see is an artifact of the, the fact that the frame rate on the camera was 60 frames per second, but that's not only what you're seeing here. So we can explain part of what you're seeing in terms of standing waves.
whoever tuned that guitar must have been using the wrong formula. It sounded like the the uh, frequency was proportional to the cube root of the tension or something because that wasn't right. Here's another one. Actually, before we watch this, you may have noticed in the last video that a lot of the the wiggles that you saw on the strings did not really look sinusoidal. It wasn't a pure sign. Some of them looked kind of jagged or triangular. That's not your imagination. And like I said, it's not just an artifact of the frame rate. It's even more clear here in this video. I'm not really sure how this was shot. It kind of doesn't look real, but I think it's real. I believe what's happening here is he plucked the string, he's recording it at a very high frame rate, slow motion, and then he just dubs some music in over it. So obviously the video we're looking at does not match the music you're hearing. Those are just separate things. And you can tell when he plucks it because the string uh, gets pulled down to the bottom of the screen. And the fact that the wave sometimes appears to be traveling so slowly probably is because of the, uh, the frame rate. I think there's a word for that interlacing i'm not really sure but the certainly the shape that you're seeing is is not an optical illusion or anything like that that's that's really the shape of the string as the wave travels down it Now you can actually see the structure of the string and it makes it more believable that we're really looking at a guitar string vibrating in slow motion. What I've done in this Python script is to superpose standing waves. If you think back to the beginning of the video, we showed that the superposition of two progressive waves traveling in opposite directions uh, produces a standing wave as long as the two waves have the same amplitude, frequency, etc. And then we looked at the fact that the, the wave equation is what they call a linear equation, meaning the sum of any two solutions is also a solution. Actually, if you scale those solutions by constant, uh, you still get a solution. So if you can add two progressive waves and get another valid motion on the wave or signal, why can't you add two standing waves and get another valid motion? So that's what I've done here in Python. And I won't bore you with the details, well, there's not too many details here, are there? Uh, but you'll notice that I've defined a wave number. I've got a length for the string. I, I made an x-axis. And then the first thing I've done is compute the y-coordinates for, hopefully you recognize, a standing wave. Here's my so-called amplitude function. The np dot, again, that's, that's numerical Python. I have to type that in order to use the sine function. That's all that is. So this is my amplitude function as the book calls it. And then here's the sinusoidal dependence on time. Now you don't see a T in there for time. You see this index I because this uh, command is inside a for loop. So I'm using this to output 250 frames that I'll string together to make an animation. And it's surprisingly easy to do that with Python. Uh, I downloaded a free piece of editing software called OpenShot that I'll show you in a second. And I just strung them together in an animation. And before I show you that, you'll see that I've got another standing wave. This one has a wave number that is twice the wave number of the, the first standing wave. See that instead of K, it's 2K. 
And the frequency here is twice the original frequency. So if you go back to our formulas that relate omega, K, F, et cetera, you'll find that uh, for a particular wave speed, so once the tension and the mass density have determined the speed of the wave on the string, doubling the frequency also requires doubling the wave number. Those two have to go up and down together. So both of these are allowable standing waves on the same string. I've even thrown in a third standing wave. See, it's got three times the frequency in time and three times the wave number. And lastly, I added those all up. Oh, I even have a fourth one, it looks like. Okay. Four standing waves I've superposed or superimposed, either word works. And you'll notice I've, all, I've also given them different amplitudes. So the one with twice the frequency has half the amplitude of the original one. Out here, there's just a factor of one. And then the one after that's got uh, an amplitude of one fourth and then one eighth. So I'm superposing four different standing waves, each of which has a smaller amplitude than the last. And they're all, they're all vibrating at different frequencies, but each of those frequencies is a multiple of the fundamental frequencies as they should be on a, a, a single string fixed at both ends. Okay, so let's take a look first at just some of the, uh, the still images and then I'll show you the little movie that I got. Here is the set of still images that I produced in Python. All I had to do is create a folder to dump these into, set that as my working directory and then let the for loop, for loop run. And it just dumped all those uh, images in there. Here I am in the free editing software called OpenShot. And I imported that set of images at a, as a sequence that was really easy to do. And then just uh, exported them as a movie. Here is the animation. It's clearly not a standing wave of one frequency. I've only got a few seconds animated, but here it is on a loop. If you look carefully, you can see that there are nodes. I've got my mouse pointer over one of those nodes. That point never goes up or down. Same thing over here. And the reason for that is pretty easy to discover. If you look back at all the different harmonics, uh, all of the harmonics share the nodes that the fundamental mode has, right? The, uh, the second harmonic has a shorter wavelength than the first, but some of its nodes line up with the, the nodes of the fundamental harmonic. And that's true for all the higher harmonics. So there still are nodes and there's still something like an anti-node, but maybe this makes it a little more plausible why you saw the patterns you did in that slow motion footage of guitar strings vibrating. Some of those patterns to me looked a lot like this. So when you pluck a guitar string, you're actually hearing a whole bunch of harmonics simultaneously with uh, all sorts of relative weights. I just picked that easy sequence of weights, one, one half, one fourth, et cetera. But if you change the weights of those various harmonics, you change what's, what's called the timbre of the sound. Have you ever wondered why an A on a clarinet, for instance, sounds so much different from an A on a trumpet? I mean, it's you might think it's the same tone, the same frequency, if they're both playing an A. Well, it's because both of those instruments are actually playing a whole set of harmonics with uh, various weights or amplitudes out front. And it's the, it's the relative, um, I guess you could say it's the ratio of all those different amplitudes that gives the instrument its characteristic timbre or sound. And really what we're talking about here is Fourier analysis. And, and many of you will encounter a lot of that later in your, edu in your education. Let's confirm here that if the frequency doubles, that's the, the rate of change in time, then the wave number also doubles as I showed you in Python. Hopefully you recall this relation, the ratio of angular frequency to wave number is the wave speed. You could also put K on the other side. And then it's very clear that for a fixed speed, and in the animation I showed, uh, those were four different standing waves superposed on the same string for which, of course, the speed is constant for each standing wave. And now you can see that omega is proportional to K. If you double K, you double omega. And that's why in the script, anytime I doubled the frequency, I also doubled the wave number. 
the last thing I'd like to point out is it's nice to have a, a very simple picture in your head of the spacing of the allowable frequencies. When you're talking about a wave that's fixed at both ends and you're looking, excuse me, a string that's fixed at both ends and you're talking about the various normal modes, uh, AKA all the harmonics, each of those allowable frequencies is an integer multiple of the fundamental frequency. And that means that they're equally spaced. In fact, the, uh, the spacing between them is the fundamental frequency F1. You can see that if you plug in N equals five versus N equals four, the difference between five F1 and four F1 is just one F1. So this fundamental frequency is the spacing between the frequencies. And that spacing can also change or can change because we know that that spacing, which is equal to the fundamental frequency, depends on the tension, depends on the length, depends on the mass density. So let's imagine that we're looking at waves on a string with lower tension, which would decrease the fundamental frequency and hence also decrease the spacing between the frequencies. And you, you might have something more like that. And we're going to see that the same simple picture and the same formula here apply to musical instruments. When you're talking about something like a flute, which is basically just a tube uh, that allows for longitudinal standing waves in the air column within the tube, the spacing of the allowable frequencies is also equal. And if you'd like to change that frequency, the spacing, let's say you'd like to develop an instrument that can hit different notes of a 12 tone scale, you might wanna change the, the spacing here. And that means changing parameters like these. Remember, this, is, this formula is only applicable for transverse waves on a string. If you're talking about longitudinal waves in air, then you would replace tension by the bulk modulus of air, which probably depends on temperature and maybe pressure. So by tweaking those things, you can change the frequencies that can be played by that simple tube. Now, real instruments have a bunch of holes or valves or keys. And what you're doing is, is essentially changing the effective length of vibrating air. Uh, the length of that column of air. So we'll save a more detailed discussion of standing waves in air columns, which is really a discussion of musical instruments for another time. Okay, one more thing, I lied. If the string that we're considering, which is fixed at both ends, has a fundamental tone F1 corresponding to this note on the keyboard, a low C, I don't actually know what that frequency is in Hertz. But if that's F1, the, the frequency F2, which we know is double the frequency F1, would be this one. F1, F2. F3 has a frequency three times F1, and that would be this note. So here's F1, F2, F3. F4 would be this one. That's four times F1. And then you'd have F5 and F6. So if I play the first six frequencies, the frequencies cor corresponding to the first six harmonics, you would hear this. And isn't it interesting that those six frequencies, which have such a simple relationship, they're all multiples of F1, they sound very pleasing to the ear. They're consonant. And that's something that, that people have marveled at for a long time. I think a couple thousand years ago, people were aware. Not, they, they didn't know about the frequencies because uh, the relation between frequency, wavelength, and wave speed, that's a more modern observation. But I think uh, some of the Greek philosophers were aware that if you strung a string between two fixed points and plucked it, that the... The frequencies are the tones produced by two strings of different lengths, which had a ratio of three to two, for instance, were uh, pleasing to the ear. They went well together. So let me add that observation here. If F2 is twice F1 and F3 is three times F1, then the ratio between these two frequencies would be three to two. Similar, similarly, the ratio between frequencies F4 and F3 would be four to three, and then you've got five to four, 
etc. So like I said, those ratios have been known for quite a while. And it's a mystery to me why the human ear should find those integer ratio, ratios so pleasing. Is that only true for human beings or do other animals also respond particularly to those frequency combinations? I guess you'd have to ask the animals. Thank you.